Okay. Hello. My name is Reinhard Bündgen. I'm the first one of the three. I have to get, get, give some credits to my colleagues, Holger and Ingo, who did the actual development behind what I'm talking to you <coughs> today. Not sure, just a show of hand. Who understands the title? Actually, few. Great. Because it's a completely <coughs> complete shift of gears. We are now going more in the field of cryptography and protocols. And well, it's a mix of technologies what, that not everybody probably knows about. I make sure that uh, you will understand if you didn't show your the hands during the presentation. So what's the challenge that we want to work on that, that we want to resolve? It's uh, the uh, challenge of identity theft in a network connection, in particular TLS, and in more particular TLS implemented with OpenSSL 3.0. <clears throat> and what can happen? Well, a TLS server typically signs his uh, data, his keys, and so on in order to prove who he is. But uh, that signing, well, is done with the key, and that key is now very valuable. If someone happens to steal that key, he can uh, steal the identity and pretend he is a right a server. That would be really nasty if the server is serving your bank account, for example. So that is what we are talking about. And stealing keys, there's a technology uh, to defend against this. This technology is typically called HSMs, hardware security modules. And those hardware security modules, <clears throat> or most of them, can be programmed against using a standard, and that standard is called PKS 11. OK. Again, the picture. Here is uh, the uh, client. He wants to connect to a server. The server identifies itself with a private key. And if that private key gets stolen and the traffic gets rerouted, you might talk to the wrong server. Clearly. If you're doing something like MTLS, uh, <coughs> mutually, uh, with mutual authentication, same problem exists for the client. OK, what is a hardware security module? A hardware security module is a device. Who doesn't have a possess a hardware security module? I'm surprised. No credit card whatsoever? It's a device that does cryptographic operations on put protected secrets <clears throat> in a way. Oh, sorry, my voice is fading. <clears throat> in a way that protects the keys. So it's typically cards, crypto cards, but also small devices like smart cards. There are good HSMs. <clears throat> would even rather destroy themselves or all data are hidden in the HSM rather than letting this data extract. And they are very often, <coughs> uh, they are certified using the FIPS 140 standard according to levels greater than two. Software is typically only uh, certified against uh, using level one. And how does this work? This uh, hardware contains secrets. <clears throat> that secret can be a single master key that is used to encrypt other keys. And then with the encrypted, the wrapped key that is available to the operating system, the uh, programs, the software has to send both the encrypted key and all the data to be worked on to the HSM. Or the uh, key, the operational keys could be stored in themselves in the HSM, then you have, of course, only limited space for oper such operational space. And the <coughs> software only sends a handle to that key, an index or whatever, to the HSM together with the data to be operated on. A little bit of a PKC is 11 technology. That is the most popular standard to work with HSMs. Clearly, HSM vendors also have their proprietary uh, interfaces very often, but uh, it looks like a, a nice common de denominator for many uh, vendors. And if you do have something, you might even have uh, a wrapper, a PKCS11 wrapper, to talk to your HSM. So 
<coughs> in HSM, all key objects come with attributes. The most important ones are the sensitive attribute and the extractable attribute. Sensitive means you cannot look into the value if sensitive is true. Uh, extractable means there is no way to get that value out of the HSM. Uh, it's, uh, this uh, is not exportable. But uh, getting the value out of the HSM doesn't mean to get it in the clear, but to wrap it with some keys in order to exchange it, for example, for co letting two HSMs communicate among each other. Okay. Operational operation, so the operational functions are typically, of course, encrypt and decrypt, uh, wrap and unwrap, and uh, derive and, of course, sign and verify. Encrypt and uncrypt, uh, encrypt, decrypt is meant to do crypto operation on, on data. Wrap and unwrap are crypto operations on keys. And they are not, and they are meant as an export operation. So un to, so wrap exports <coughs> a key and unwraps uh, imports a wrapped key into the HSM. This is uh, the idea of these uh, two operations. Derive is of course something like ECDH or a KDF function. Um, even so, the standard allows many combinations. Uh, there is something about the derive. Uh, function that HSM uh, implementers typically uh, do. They constrain that if the input keys to be derived from which another key shall be derived, if those keys are sensitive, then the output key is sensitive. If they would allow both, it would make the, uh, <coughs> the well, the uh, goal of the HSM uh, just go away. So even so, the standard would allow to, to derive a non-sensitive key from a sensitive uh, private and pub public key. Well, public keys are always non-sensitive. From a, a sensitive private key, uh, HSM uh, vendors wouldn't uh, allow this in their hardware. They wouldn't get it certified. OK, just to be on the safe side, a short overview on uh, a protocol like TLS. It starts up with a handshake, where the keys to be used in the future uh, communication, which are typically uh, symmetric keys for bulk encryption, are exchanged, and the server signs its key material with its signing key. And if you have uh, mutual authentication, the client does the same. But um, most server in most connections are not mutual uh, TLS connections. So uh, what's happening is that in the uh, upper part, in the handshake part of the protocol, uh, <coughs> public private asymmetric uh, cryptography is involved. Uh, two types of uh, asymmetric cryptography typically. Uh, the, the signing type of cryptography and key derivation be it RSA key exchange or an ECDH key exchange. Okay, now look, let's look at the different key types that are involved in such a key exchange. First of all, we have the private signing keys. There are long-lived keys. The location in memory can be, ex <laughs> if that, uh, location where these keys reside can be extracted. Just remember Heartbleed, which was one of such a such vulnerability. Such a key could be extracted and stolen. And uh, well, uh, this key also must be uh, stored on media somewhere because well, uh, after rebooting your server, you wanna not get all of a sudden a completely new uh, Identity, so there must be a way to store this key uh, safely, securely. <clears throat> then we have private keys for key exchange. If you're using an RSA key exchange, that key is typically also long lived. Uh, I think uh, most TLS uh, implementation use the same RSA key for signing and for the uh, wrapping. Uh, for ECDH, well, 
Typically, uh, TLS, in particular TLS 1.3, doesn't use proper TLS uh, ECDH or uh, Diffie-Hellman, but it uses the ephemeral variant of it, and it's uh, strongly recommended to use that. These are short-lived keys. They're only uh, generated at the beginning of, the, uh, of a connection and a new one for each connection. Why so? Well, generating uh, ECDH keys is fast, easy, it's just a random number plus a, 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 a multiplication. Uh, and for RSA, uh, key generation is very uh, heavy, uh, time consuming. Therefore, there is no ephemeral RSA. Even so, one could uh, consider this. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, the, the symmetric keys involved. These are the ones uh, that have been derived. So they are as ephemeral as the ECD. H keys. And on the other hand, for those keys, performance matters because we might uh, encrypt a lot of data. The handshake is only done once, so if you have lots of lots of uh, <coughs> connections, uh, then performance of the handshake may uh, matter if the, connect, uh, if the co connections are short. But uh, typically, uh, the uh, performance of uh, the uh, symmetrical keys really matter. Well, why is performance an issue? Well, uh, asymmetric keys are slow, and if you go to an HSM, an HSM is slow. If you want to back down your communication, run everything, each AES computation on an HSM, because it, it involves an I.O. to an external device. And therefore, we have more or less uh, two groups of keys, keys that I call high-risk keys, where I strongly recommend HSM protections, and keys that I consider low-key because the damage if those keys get lost. Keys are always uh, valuable, but some are more valuable, others less valuable. Uh, they have a limited risk and limited impact, and I think it's uh, perfectly fine to use them with plain, as plain text keys and uh, have them in your memory uh, while, your co connect, while your connection is open. Okay, uh, a, a little bit now we want to uh, combine OpenSSL and PKCS11. And we have to <coughs> look a little bit how things match. With OpenSSL, Symmetric keys are represented by byte strings that are as long as the key is strong. So if I have an AS128 key, it's 128 bits long. It's as long as the mathematical, minimal mathematical representation of this key. For asymmetric keys, it's a little bit different. There we have something like an opaque object that represents the key which is typically structured and must be uh, something more complex uh, anyway. And uh, there is a way to represent those uh, asymmetric keys in a uh, key store. As for uh, PKC11, both symmetric keys and uh, asymmetric keys are represented as objects because they not only contain the key material, but also the attributes, some of which we have looked at, like the sensitive or extractable attribute. But there are others that restrict what the key may be used for, so they're keys. They may, you can define a key that is <coughs> only used for wrapping or a key is only used for signing, stuff like that. Okay. Um, OpenSSL is not meant to use HSM. It's um, a normal uh, plain text key uh, library. It's a good one. I'm not, uh, that's n uh, no criticism at all. It's the de facto standard, I guess. Uh, LibCrypto, if you so want, is the most popular crypto library there is currently, uh, but it was always uh, prepared for plugins. Uh, before OpenSSL version 3.0 uh, was released, the plugin me mechanism was called uh, uh, Engine. And such an engine could provide a replacement of a function implementation. 
since uh, OpenSSL 3.0, that plugin uh, uh, format has changed. The name has also changed. We now have a provider, and a provider has a different goal. It implements more or less an abstract data type or uh, an object, and it has comes with requirements that for this uh, key data type, it must implement uh, export and import methods, and these are not HSM export and import methods, but uh, methods that allow to exchange objects between different provider types. And it must implement uh, all functions and methods that uh, this key can be used for in OpenSSL. And we will see these uh, constraints cause some problems in providing in implementing a, a good uh, PKCS11 provider. Another concept that we need is uh, a so-called OpenSSL key store. It contains key objects that uh, depend on the external storage format. For example, there is an RFC that defines an URI to refer to a uh, PKCS11 key. And uh, so uh, you can have a key store that contains keys that are represented by such an URI. And uh, the keys in such a key store can be uh, interpreted in a provider-specific manner. For example, the URIs for PKCS, uh, an URI for PKCS11 key can be transformed by the prov prov provider into an according PKCS11 key handle. The application must know, the application using OpenSSL must know where to load the key from and then uh, insert it into the uh, key store. Well, for symmetric keys, as uh, I say, they must uh, fit in uh, bit strings uh, of their key lengths. Uh, that works uh, best for plain text keys. It may work for encrypted keys, depending on the padding. So encrypting an AS192 key might be a challenge because, well, it's a multiple of block size. And uh, padding will have uh, required padding. So it, <coughs> such a key will be at least uh, 256 bits long. Open SSL variables for symmetric key uh, well, therefore cannot refer to PKCS11 secure keys. Now, let's look at the different key types and how we can handle them. So for uh, RSA keys, uh, they can be referred to by the uh, URI uh, format that I mentioned. The key generation uh, is not needed in the TLS protocol. That's good. The provider export, well, uh, export of private uh, PKC is 11 keys uh, must be disallowed because, well, a private key is an HSM key and I cannot um, somehow transform its value and provide it, for example, to a FIPS provider for OpenSSL. So that uh, wouldn't be a good thing. But uh, the good uh, news is it's not needed in the TLS protocol. The crypto function that we as a provider must support is signing, that's okay, and it's key exchange, but this key exchange must be implemented using the PKCS11 encrypt and uh, decrypt functions, not with the, uh, <coughs> uh, with the wrap unwrap function, and it tells you that you need to uh, exchange plain text keys, not uh, HSM keys. Well, well, what you do exchange in, uh, in the TLS protocols are symmetric keys. And as you uh, saw before, these symmetric keys are in a class that are considered lower risk, less valuable if you so want. So <clears throat> with RSA, we more or less have, uh, RSA seems to be a good key type that a provider can handle. The EC, uh, EC keys are, are, are cause a problem, and the problem is actually the um, 
way uh, OpenSSN handles EC key types. It doesn't distinguish between EC signing keys, uh, EC DSA keys, if you so want, and uh, key derivation keys, ECDH keys. It's just uh, EC keys and a provider that handles an EC key must, according to the specification of providers, provide all the functions. Um, again, although these keys can be uh, defined using an URI or can be referred to using an uh, URI, key generation is not needed for signing keys. Key generation is needed for the ephemeral ECDH keys. So somehow our uh, provider uh, would have to generate an ECD ECDH uh, key. Provider export of private keys uh, must be disallowed. Luckily, it's not needed, hopefully. Uh, the crypto functions that we uh, require would be signing. And again, a key exchange is, uh, well, in particular in TLS 1.3, uh, ECDH -E is the only key exchange uh, that is uh, supported by the latest protocol. Um, we cannot use the HSN uh, uh, derive function because that function, when, giving, when given a uh, <coughs> sensitive key, would generate a sensitive key. A, gener a sensitive key would be an HSM object, which would, couldn't be uh, used uh, by OpenSSL. Okay, here we have a problem that we have to work on. So that, and that is the dilemma. EC key generation must be implemented uh, by the provider because it's used by the TLS uh, protocol. We cannot just say we don't use it. And then uh, if you have an uh, EC uh, key, it should go, and we want to use the provider, it should go there. The derivation uh, should be implemented by the provider. And uh, it may not be, on the other hand, it may not be computed on the HSM due to the reason I uh, mentioned before. Now, we could think that we can export it and give it to another provider. That doesn't work either because the ECDH key being, uh, if, it's, uh, if it were generated in the HSM, then it's a protected key that we cannot just export because that would uh, make the uh, HSM protection well, fail. There are ways to export them if you set the attributes accordingly, but there are hacks, and uh, again, these uh, things, well, just tear down all the HSM protection. You shouldn't do that. So uh, we cannot uh, export it. Um, so what, uh, we, we must not use it. So uh, what do we do? The uh, solution to the dilemma is to work with two different key spaces. Uh, one key space for the signing keys and another uh, key space for the, uh, the <coughs> for the other, for ephemeral keys, I must say, because with RSA the uh, tolerance is a little bit uh, different. Key generation, uh, always uh, generates keys of the second key space, of the ephemeral keys. Uh, keys of the key space number one must be, must be there as a given. They must be generated outside of uh, the protocol out of that of the system. You go to your HSM, say generate key with whatever tool is your preferred one, be it a P11 kit, be it uh, our open, uh, <coughs> crypto key, uh, P11 sec, or whatever, you generate a key and configure your uh, TLS server. You don't do it inside your OpenSSL, uh, in, uh, inside your program using the OpenSSL interface. You can do it inside your application using, uh, talking to PKCS11 uh, directly. So the signing operations are implemented in the provider for key space one. The derivation uh, operations, key derivation operations are implemented for ephemeral keys by forwarding. 
uh, the, um, uh, by, um, uh, by a plain text uh, implementation. So you uh, may kind of forward uh, uh, the implementation uh, the, to another provider, for example. Same, uh, <coughs> same uh, for the key space two. These are generated, but they're not generated on an HSM. If you generate a key from key spaces, but you generate a plain text uh, key for those. So, uh, application. The, uh, so we have a few uh, restrictions with that. Uh, the application must not uh, generate uh, keys of key space one using the provider, but outside of the provider. Uh, they, uh, the application must not use signing keys for uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, operations because our uh, because the signing keys, as we know, they come from the uh, one key space and uh, keys using Diffie-Hellman must be in the second key space. And uh, keys uh, that are used in uh, <coughs> Diffie-Hellman-like key derivations, they must be ephemeral. And these ephemeral keys are uh, uh, must not uh, <coughs> must not be uh, HSM protected. Not all applications fulfill these uh, restrictions, but a typical uh, security protocol does. In, in particular, TLS. There are a few things that make uh, working with PKC is eleven uh, hard. So uh, typically, uh, well. I haven't introduced the term token yet. A token is the representation of an HSM in the uh, HSM uh, in the PKCS11 standard. And uh, in order to use with a token, you typically need a pin. Uh, and uh, so the application must be configured to learn which token is used or which slot is used. Tokens are associated with slots. The slot would be a small number, and the token and the pin is some uh, pin. You have to provide the pin to use the token. So somehow uh, you have to uh, provide the pin to the program. We choose for our uh, provider that the pin is included in the URI. The, uh, the RFC, the standard, uh, uh, allows this. So the pin representation includes the URI or a a po the pass to a file that includes CRI. Um, clearly, you do not want to st uh, uh, store, uh, have your application expect to store the uh, URI somewhere with a uh, pin included. So maybe your application has to kind of uh, edit the URI that you uh, load from your file system and includes a pin somehow after it has been provided interactively or however by some secure means. Uh, then uh, PKC is 11 keys are represented by handles. And handles are specific to sessions. So there is, and a session is a computation context in PKC is 11 for a cryptographic operation that goes over multiple steps or a hash over multiple steps. Uh, so with each new session, according to the standard, not according to all uh, implementations, but according to the standard, if you want to use a key, you have to find the key anew and get a new handle for the key. The sessions may not be shared between processes, and uh, whenever you start a new process, you have to call C initialize in order to initialize your PKS11 system. That is uh, a little obstacle uh, when, uh, when your application is doing lots of forks, for example. So, we have 
<coughs> implemented exactly a provider that uh, follows the constraints that we have. We call it a, a sign provider because it does only the uh, signing part of PKC is 11 and uh, it uh, does everything else, the key space, uh, key. so it works on key space one with the HSM, <clears throat> and it works on key space uh, two with uh, another means, in co since we didn't want to duplicate code, we used some uh, if you want tags to actually uh, call code from other providers of OpenSSL, from the de default providers. Uh, that um, it works for with uh, RSA and EC, uh, DSA and ECDH. It has been tested. Well, uh, some in the audience know that we maintain Open Cryptoki, a P open source PKS 11 implementation. So we have, of course, tested uh, this with Open Cryptoki and uh, different tokens, some of which are real HSMs, uh, others are uh, software to uh, tokens. We use uh, OpenSSL S server and S client uh, to prove that things work. And uh, we also made uh, Apache work. However, we had to do uh, a little bit, uh, <coughs> well, uh, with a few, uh, Apache needs a few patches. It doesn't yet know to uh, deal with the URI uh, scheme that we use. So we have to add this. And uh, we ran it in debug mode, minus X, because currently our provider has a restriction that uh, it doesn't do the C initialize right if the application that calls OpenSSL is forked. We know what to do, but due to resource constraints, we didn't have yet the time uh, to do it. So in order to run Apache in a mode that doesn't fork, uh, we use the minus X option of Apache. By the way, uh, well, we, have, we even have a little movie uh, what you have to do to uh, configure the uh, provider correctly. Um, that is Okay, um, that is actually uh, what I just uh, said. Uh, we uh, forward the uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, requests to the, um, to the other uh, default providers, and uh, that way an application, uh, if using a, a signature operation, it's uh, going to the PKC11 token, and if the application using is using uh, derive or verify uh, operations, it's going to the uh, forwarding provider. By the way, we did all the, we didn't uh, send the verify operations or the encrypt operations to the HSM. They are not security relevant. Uh, they, are, they are using public keys and we uh, decided to also forward them. It's uh, good for performance reasons because then you can use your local uh, <coughs> implementation rather than uh, doing the IOs. Well, uh, pin handling, I said we uh, allow in the uh, URI to either include the pin directly or to include a pass to the pin. pin. Uh, the, the piping option uh, for that pin uh, is not supported. There are a few uh, more HSM PKC11 uh, providers or approaches. One of my colleague uh, who uses it in a tool uh, that allows uh, HSM protected keys to be used uh, uh, with dmcrypt and uh, when communicating to a key management server but uh, that provider uh, co talks uh, a native uh, HSM language, not uh, PKC11. And then there's another uh, project currently, uh, uh, I think it's led by Simo Source from Red Hat. They are working on a generic PKC11 provider. They are not going with the uh, restriction. Well, we are, we are satisfied if we can at least do the uh, signing part with the HSM. 
and they are running, of course, in a few challenges. Uh, actually, that provider in some tests seems to work, even so that hasn't really solved the uh, ECDH problem in the way we did, and uh, we think it's due to uh, uh, some luck in the provider selection for the keys that is pre presented. If you do not fix the provider uh, priority, um, currently all crypto is done in providers, by default in the default provider, of course, uh, then uh, you're not sure which provider is used. And then it uh, seems like if you're just using default uh, settings, um, the ECDH somehow uh, is, at least in our experiment, was uh, uh, routed to the default provider which is just fine, but uh, doesn't really uh, uh, follow the, documentation, uh, the provider documentation. Okay, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there are a few uh, differences seemingly between the provider specification and the provider framework. Uh, it looks like missing crypto functions are possibly automatically forwarded uh, to the uh, default provider. Uh, that is something that at least wasn't the case when we started out with our provider work, so that might have changed uh, during the lifetime of OpenSSL 3.0. And, uh, well, each implementation, if, even if the spec says it's... Uh, not defined what's happened, the implementation, of course, must be deterministic. So there are a few uh, suggestions to the OpenSSL provider work uh, from our team, uh, in particular to bind uh, the, prov to the provider uh, to a key store so that only if keys are taken from the key store, the provider is used and, and, and all the other keys are are handled by the default provider. And another uh, requirement would be uh, not to require to implement all functions that, are, that a key can be used with uh, in, inside the provider. So that it's just a partial data type if you so want. Okay, now um, I, I mentioned uh, uh, the uh, project uh, from CMO source, uh, there uh, may be reasons why you want to have a generic PKCS11 provider, but you should uh, very well uh, think uh, what that reason could be. I, I even have a reason in mind why I would have uh, want to want to have one, but uh, I think one thing is not a reason to have a generic PKCS11 provider if you just like the OpenSSL API better than PKC11. That's a bad reason. Because, well, that, then use uh, OpenSSL. If you want to have an HSM and uh, you're not bound by other reasons to use OpenSSL, then please use PKC11. It's tailored to do, to tell the HSM what it wants to do. The uh, OpenSSL API is just not as of today. So, a good reason to use a PKC11 provider is if you have an application and uh, you have certain aspects of your application. An application that uses OpenSSL works fine with clear keys <clears throat> and you want to just configure it or modestly modify it in order to use an HSM. That is, for me, a valid reason to use a PKC11 provider. Not because I like one interface better than the other, because both APIs, both interfaces have their merit and uh, they're made that way <coughs> to do what they uh, are meant to do. Okay, uh, what's really missing uh, is uh, support for uh, symmetric keys and what is needed uh, in order to let OpenSSL support symmetric keys is some opaque object concept for symmetric keys. Uh, there was a proposal some years ago from Nicolas uh, Tuveri, who actually worked with us on that uh, project. And uh, only recently I was pointed uh, to a discussion where some <coughs> 
where this uh, is being worked on, and I think that is uh, great news. It looks like the community uh, is uh, understanding the problems now, and hopefully in the not so far future, we have a uh, solution. And with that, I want to end my talk. I, I think uh, it's, and conclude, it's possible to implement a PKCS 11 provider that at least protects your most valuable uh, TLS keys. Uh, the provider framework um, is nice, but it has uh, some uh, weird uh, aspects that we might want to work on in order to uh, do this in a more natural way. I think the hook of uh, just, just forwarding things, um, even Holger, who implemented it, thinks it's ugly. He doesn't like it, but it, he liked it more than duplicating code, at least. <laughs> that's why, uh, that's uh, why I did it. And uh, yes, there are a few reasons why uh, a generic PKC is 11 provider makes sense, and uh, some things need to change in OpenSSL to make this happen. And with that, I'm open to questions. No, I didn't, uh, we didn't test it with UBT, but uh, I think uh, the implementation contains uh, the link. Uh, feel free to do it, and I, we would be very interested in uh, learning about your experience. If you find bugs, please report them. Let's try if this one's working. Hello, I guess not. So maybe you would need to uh, repeat the question for the uh, for the virtual audience. This this one's not working, I guess. Okay. Uh, actually, we have two questions. So the first one is about the, uh, the usage of the engine in the pre open SSL three area. So yes. what was what was there different in terms of PKCS eleven that was supported like almost fully that you could have just used it in the whole TLS. Uh, Communication where you can you can have the URIs and then you just pass it over to the engine into the OpenSSL and then create the uh, server. Uh, and the second question would be, what is the problem with wrapping and unwrapping when we talk about the uh, PKCS level? You just briefly touched this, but yes. didn't elaborate much. Okay. Uh, first topic: uh, What was there before? There were providers. There were engines. And actually, there was a, a PKCS eleven engine from the OpenSC. Uh, a project. Uh, I do not know all. Oh, should I should I go here? I, I do not know all the features of this uh, engine, uh, but it worked at least uh, for what we as a signing provider. That worked fine. We tested this, and I think it had the same problem that the engine didn't do uh, C initialize on fork. <laughs> And uh, the second question was uh, about uh, encrypt, decrypt versus uh, wrap, unwrap. Okay, In, uh, these are now PKC is 11 terms. So uh, encrypt encrypts data and uh, decrypt decrypts data. So that is easy. You can consider a key as being data and then encrypt and decrypt the de key material. That is what our uh, provider, sign provider does for when using RSA as a key exchange mechanism. Yes, it uses, it, it takes the uh, value of a plain text key, encrypts it, or, well, actually the provider would uh, decrypt it on the HSM because the encryption operation is done with the public key. Now, <clears throat> PKC is 11 has an operation that is called wrap, unwrap. Uh, that is, well, let, let's consider the, uh, the, the, the uh, wrap function is an export function. So you have a key handle uh, of a, a 
key that is protected in the, by the HSM. You provide uh, that key handle together with a unwrapping key and the HSM will return the plain text value of the key to be unwrapped encrypted uh, with the wrapping key. The idea is that another HSM also has access to the wrapping key, either to the according uh, private wrapping key or before the uh, wrapping key was, uh, it's a symmetric wrapping key that was negotiated between the two HSMs. And it can now use a uh, unwrap operation to import the key. So it, you give it uh, this encrypted uh, string and the unwrap key, a key handle to the unwrap key and the HSM does the unwrapping. Now, you can, of course, generate your a, uh, RSA wrap unwrap key pair using SSL and um, <coughs> export uh, an HSM protected key into a clear key. That is the trick I mentioned. Yes, because you know the private key, you can, you can do it in the clear, but that is just what you shouldn't do with an HSM. Um, if your uh, key, HSM key is flagged as non-extractable, so CKA extractable equals C, C underscore false, then this, uh, the, uh, unwrap, the wrapping operation isn't possible. There are all, there's also a flag that you can only wrap with trusted and you must uh, somehow have your uh, operator flag your keys as trusted uh, to, re to restrict that attack, yes. So your HSM might be configured to not allow it and if you do it, you just uh, work against the spirit of an HSM. Did it answer your question? Uh, um, yeah, um, you said at one point that you have ways to extract private keys or secrets from, from the HSM, but it's very slow, uh, you said. It sounds like you have some, some information leak there. Uh, how would you do that? I mean, um, it's, it's slightly off topic, I suppose, but uh, I, uh, uh, do you have a backdoor? <laughs> can you repeat your question? Uh, only half of it. Uh, uh, oh, uh, right, so you said, uh, at some slide, you said that you have ways to extract the private key from the HSM, yes, but you don't want to do that. I just mentioned with this RSA, from uh, RSA key pair from OpenSSL, if that is this operation. Okay. So you shouldn't do that, and uh, if you're careful, you configure your HSM and your keys to not allow it. Any other questions? Not, I think we are ready for lunch. Yes, lunch is next. We'll reconvene at 210.